Hello, and welcome back to another class in history of ancient Greece. In this lecture, we are going to take events in the Peloponnesian War down to what is referred to as the Peace of Nicaea, 421 BC. And this peace was a temporary cessation of hostilities within the war itself. We're going to focus on the successful Athenian campaign at Pylos and the island of Sphacteria in the year 425, 424 in some detail. And this will involve an analysis of Cleon's role in political affairs, where I perhaps take a different opinion and far more positive view of his role. And then we'll end this introductory part of the lecture at the Battle of Amphipolis in the year 422 BC, in which Cleon and the Spartan general Brasidas died, and which led to the Peace of Nicias. So in 425 BC, an Athenian fleet headed for Sicily dropped off a contingent of troops at the island of Pylos, which was in the southwest Peloponnese. Uh, it's on a bay across from a narrow island called Sphacteria. This, by the way, is in the modern bay of Navarino. The Italian name comes from the time when the Venetians were in Greece in, uh, in the uh, early modern period. The troops were under the command of one Demosthenes, and this is not the famous Demosthenes who I was talking about in our last class together, the famous orator from the later fourth century. Um, this Demosthenes gave his men orders to fortify Pylos. Whether this was part of some predetermined plan or to stop the men simply from getting bored, one is never sure. My belief is that it was deliberate policy that the fortification of Pylos followed on from the annual periplus, that is the annual sailing around the Peloponnesus by the Athenian ships, about a hundred or so, that was part of Pericles' strategy. And fortifying Pylos meant that this was an attack, if you like, on Sparta itself. The Athenians were trying to grasp Sparta by its Achilles heel. Pylos was in Messenia, home of the Helots, and of course, why else would one fortify a place in Messenia unless one was trying to whip up the Helots to revolt in some way? The Athenians, I suspect, were trying to establish a base to stir the Helots up, therefore, for a possible revolt, and this would have distracted Sparta's attention from Athens immediately. By 425 BC, the period that we're looking at, Sparta had made some serious inroads into Boeotia at the request of the city-state of Thebes. And in fact, two years prior in 427 BC, it had destroyed the pro-Athenian town of Plataea. Since Boeotia bordered directly on Attica's northern border, as we know, the Athenians may have been viewing with no small alarm the growth of Spartan influence to the north. And so two years later, they decided to do something about it, therefore fortify Pylos to try to divert Sparta's attention from Athens. That makes perfect sense. Needless to say, the Spartans didn't take the Athenian fortification of Pylos lying down. They developed, I'm sorry, they deployed 420 Peloponnesian hoplites to the island of Sphacteria, and they sent a further force by sea to eject the Athenians from Pylos. Well, as soon as he had heard what the Spartans were up to, Demosthenes, the Athenian general, sent an urgent request for help to the Athenian fleet, that is the fleet that had just dropped him off, and uh, they immediately returned to Pylos. Well, on its return, a naval battle was fought in the Bay of Pylos that resulted in a decisive Athenian victory. Once again, the superiority of the Athenian navy uh, was on display. However, the 420 Peloponnesian troops that had been dropped off earlier on Sphacteria were now cut off, and the Athenians blockaded now them on the island. What is more, of these 420 troops, 120 of them were Spartiates. Remember, this is the full Spartan citizens, the ones who went through the Agoge, the kind of prize jewel of the Spartan uh, polis. The rest of these men were from Sparta's allies in the Peloponnesian League. Well, this defeat, the Bay of Pylos, and then the subsequent blockade of Sphacteria, and resulting uh, was a serious um, surprise, uh, Sparta, um, because 
essentially out of the blue, the, the Spartan government sued for peace with Athens. And in the process, it asked for a safe passage for the 420 troops on the island of Siberia. And that is startling, isn't it? Because the Spartans, you know, doing for peace, their whole ethos, we're accustomed to the Spartan ethos of dying in battle, aren't we? Of having, you know, one's mother uh, kill a, a, a soldier who came back home uh, from a defeated force. So we need to try to come up with some explanation for why the Spartans sued for peace like this. One would certainly expect that the 128 Spartiates on Sphacteria would be sacrificed by the state, you know, that they should, uh, that they would just be considered losses of war. In fact, we'd even think that those Spartiates on the island would expect to be abandoned, uh, expect to have to die, um, but far from it. So what's going on here? Well, there's no compelling reason why the Spartans took the course of action that they did. There's not one definitive answer. Perhaps their, their appeal for peace might be linked to the declining manpower problems that the Spartans were facing, as we talked about uh, earlier on in our course together. You remember that the entire core of the Thebes had been wiped out in a great earthquake in the year 460. And now we're in 425, so uh, not that much later, uh, a generation later, but still, uh, now we have 120 soldiers on Spacteria. It doesn't sound like a lot, but if the Spartans were desperate to get them back because of manpower shortages, then we can see how seriously that earthquake 40 years ago had affected them. Well, all of a sudden, the Athenians have a chance to end hostilities. And who is on hand um, but Cleon? He is now the kingpin in the assembly. And what he did has earned him pretty much universal condemnation on the part of modern historians because he persuaded the people to reject the Spartan overtures for peace. At first sight, at first sight this seems rash, especially as the Athenians were still recovering from the plague that had run its course in about 428. Uh, it took 15 years or so for the Athenians to recover fully from it. Um, and as I said, modern historians have condemned Cleon for this course of action. But I think he was right. <laughs> you see, what the Spartans wanted was an armistice. And an armistice is not a peace. It's really more like a timeout, uh, uh, you know, a truce that is temporary. And Cleon, I think, is right. Uh, he saw correctly that any truce agreed on at this time on terms which left the Spartans just as powerful as they had been at the start of the war would be ephemeral, would be like a vapor. Because once the Spartans got their troops back from Sphacteria, then it would be a return to the battle days of 431, before 431, before the outbreak of the Peloponnesian War. Um, the resources on each side had not diminished that much. So to go simply to spend all the time fighting and then go back simply to the way it was before, that really would have meant uh, nothing productive for Athens at all. And it would have been actually uh, put, left them in a weak position. You remember that Thucydides' explanation, the truest explanation for the war, as he put it, um, was Sparta's fear of the growth of Athens's power. Well, that wasn't going to, to abate. That fear of Athens's power was not going to abate. If war ended now, the Athenians would simply then focus on extending their empire, and that was what had been uh, that is what they had been doing since they founded the thing in 478 BC, the Delian League. I'm afraid. And the Spartans, for their part, would simply continue to be afraid of the growth in Athens's power. So eventually, the two sides would. A truce now, an armistice, wouldn't achieve anything in the long run. And Cleon, I would argue, knew the value of imposing terms on the Spartans, and the only way to impose terms on them would be to defeat them fair and square, soundly, not agreeing to let them get troops back that would, as I say, restore the status quo. Cleon then, by my interpretation, saw the value of taking these soldiers alive, because they would be security against future Spartan invasions of Attica, kind of like a collateral. Uh, remember that the Spartans' strategy had been of annual invasion and then ravaging the lands around the city of Athens. And moreover, uh, 
the Spartans would give the Athenians, um, I'm sorry, the Spartan hostages would give the Athenians an upper hand in peace negotiation in the future. The Cleon, I think, rightly advised the Athenians to reject Sparta's offer and to besiege Sphacteria with a view to capturing those Peloponnesian hoplites on it. Now, that is a heretical position. I just want to let you know. Um, uh, and, um, and, and not everybody would agree with that position, but I do think that it is correct, and I kind of like Cleon for my part. I don't think he deserves the bad press that he gets, and I'm going to defend him as much as I can right now in our lecture. Well, the siege, the siege of Sacteria was entrusted to the aristocratic and wealthy general uh, Nicias, Nicias. Uh, and his background made him a natural enemy of a rhetor like Cleon, a demagogue, if you like. For some reason, Nicias wasn't able to capture the troops on the island, and as the siege grew protracted and costly, the initial euphoria of the Athenians dissipated. This is normal human behavior, of course. You're euphoric at the start, and then as something carries on, one starts to get disillusioned with it, uh, taking so long. The Athenians' discontent was shown at an assembly meeting at which Cleon attacked Nicias for his inefficiency. Thucydides tells us about this assembly clash and what he does, which I find very interesting, is that he gives us the speeches of both Nicias, Nicias and Cleon, but not in direct speech. He gives them an indirect speech. He doesn't quote them verbatim, which of course must be put in quotation marks because uh, even the, the speeches that he does, does give verbatim are not really verbatim. They're simply rendition, right? That he, uh, that he has come up with, as he did, if you remember in our last class together, with the speeches of Cleon and Diodotus about the Mytilene debate. Well, Cleon apparently tore into Nicias for his bungling of this uh, situation and for his caution. Um, and he began to boast that he, Cleon, if he were in charge, he would end the siege. Well, apparently, says Thucydides, this appealed to the crowd of citizens present who shouted even more in favor of Cleon. Thucydides then goes on to say that this shouting was normal for a mob. And this is how, of course, he can do. He contemptuously calls the people uh, because of the political power that they had. The Ochlos. Um, Thucydides very much disliked the power of the people. We get reminded again then of the view of the, the aristocrats had uh, to popular power. We also get an insight into just how noisy the assemblies could be. But let's not forget uh, the point that I made in a previous lecture that if the statistic is right, uh, from what scholars have deduced, only about 20% of the people present could actually hear what was going on. And even then, it was only 85% of what was going on. So 20% of the people could hear 85% of what was going on. Not a very um, high. According to Thucydides, Nicias suddenly called what he thought was Cleon's bluff. And he told him to go and do his job if he thought he could do it better than he, Nicias. Um, when Cleon couldn't wriggle out of that situation, as he kind of got caught up in his, perhaps his, um, the crowd cried out even more uh, for him to go to Sacteria and capture the troops. And at that point, he suddenly requested Demosthenes as partner in the venture. He demanded various troops, and then he declared dramatically that he would return victorious in 20 days. The Athenians laughed at this, says Thucydides, because they knew they, uh, they would win either way. In other words, either Cleon would live up to his promise, Thucydides calls it a mad promise, uh, and so they would end up with Spartan prisoners in Athens, which would be a good thing, or Cleon would die uh, trying to capture them, and hence all of Athens would be better off without him. So that's the, the state of things there. Well, to everyone's surprise, Cleon and Demosthenes did manage to capture the troops on Sacterium, and they brought them back to Athens within 20 days. Apparently, they simply set the island on fire, uh, and of course, people ran from the fire. The, the soldiers that were on the island ran from them, from the fire, and they would, and then the Athenians simply waited for them on the other side, and uh, were able to kind of mop up anyone who was putting up any new resistance. Of the original contingent of 420 soldiers, only 292 were left. But 120 of those 292 were Spartiates. So those 120 Spartiates were indeed 
the prize capture. Although the war continued, the presence of Spartan prisoners in Athens ended the annual invasions of Attica to ravage the land, and that was something that Cleon had predicted when he said we need to take those Spartan troops alive. There's no question that Pylos Sphacteria incident was a major, major victory, and Cleon's influence in Athens dramatically burgeoned afterward. After the troops of Sphacteria were captured, Cleon left the Mosthenes behind, as I said, to engage in mopping up operations, and he himself, Cleon, returned to Athens with the prison. He was subsequently elected Strategos, that is general, for the following year, and this was really a rather a reversal of the pattern of those who used the generalship, the strategia, the strategia as a stepping stone to political life. Um, also in 424 BC, Cleon increased the forros, that is the tribute tax, since Athens was in a bad way financially. And in some cases he doubled it, and in other cases he tripled it, the amount of tribute an ally was to pay. Well, as a result, the forros increased to, to an annual income of 1,500 talents. Needless to say, the allies saw this as an act of ear extortion, outright despotism. Cleon also increased jury pay, incidentally, uh, at this time from two obols a day, that which Pericles had introduced in the 450s to now three obols a day. Perhaps this was meant to be some sort of recompense, if you like, compensation for those farmers whose lands had been in Spartan invasion. Well, no one, as far as I know, has ever really given the clash in the assembly between Cleon and Nicias more than passing attention. But I think there's a lot going on here. The common opinion is that Cleon backed himself into a corner with a lot of, of uh, barroom talk, uh, a lot of brag uh, you know, uh, braggadocious kind of talk. But fortunately for him, when he got to Sphacteria, the more militarily experienced Demosthenes was there to bail him. This is kind of the view that Thucydides presents, and it is certainly what modern historians have. But I disagree with it completely. One thing, when Cleon was given this charge, uh, that is the charge by the assembly to go to Sphacteria, he immediately trotted out an impressive list of specialist troops, archers, infantry, troops, uh, and those, these men he wanted to take to Demosthenes. Now, you don't have all of those details just simply in your head if all you're planning on doing at the assembly is standing up and verbally trash-talking your opponent. Cleon was by now in 425 slash 424 a seasoned politician. He wasn't a military tactician, true, and Demosthenes, on the other hand, was a general, he was a strategos, but he, he was not a political. If Cleon had asked for these troops and the command of them uh, against Sphacteria off the bat, when he first stood up in the assembly, he would have gotten nowhere with the people. But I can quite easily see Demosthenes telling Cleon ahead of time, making, you know, do a little kind of backroom dealing, uh, what, uh, maybe telling him what troops he needed, and Cleon manipulating the crowd against Nicias to make it seeing like Nicias had backed him into a corner and then saying, okay, I'll take on this job after all, all I need is such and such. Well, whatever the case of that may be, the Pylos Sphacteria campaign was an enormous win for the Athenians, but the odium attached to the rhetores, these demagogues, is seen in how Thucydides and his contemporary playwright, the, um, uh, uh, his contemporary, the, the playwright Aristophanes, uh, treated the victory. Thucydides glosses it over. He doesn't even have grudging praise for Cleon. Perhaps that's why he gives us only the barest outline of the assembly clash in Cleon and Nicias. That is why he gives us not the speeches in direct speech, but only in kind of indirect statement and reported speech. Whatever the case of that may be, he, he, he might do that as, a, as just I'm putting out there as a conjecture because Cleon did well, and Thucydides really did, didn't want to spend any time highlighting a guy doing well who he didn't like. His account is also manipulated so that we end up feeling sorry for Nicias, poor old Nicias being abused this way by this upstart Cleon, um, you know, who ought to have stayed in his tanning shop. Yet, and this was often 
uh, not mentioned. It was Nicias who handed over the command to Cleon. And as a result, Nicias ought to have suffered censure from the people for that. It wasn't his job to resign from his command, but Nicias was not abused for it, even though we know that the Athenians were quick to censure ineptitude, disloyalty, and treachery on the part of their elected officials. Even worse is the portrayal of the Pylos Sphacteria campaign in the play by Aristophanes, The Knights was performed in that same year, 424, uh, the same year as the Sphacterian campaign, written by Aristophanes. This play uh, casts Cleon as a Paphlagonian slave, evil, venal, and bewitched, uh, one who bewitched the people of Athens. The people are cast by Aristophanes as old gullible men uh, in the person of the character Demos, not exactly a subtle reference there, it means the people as we've said before, the technical term for the Athenian citizenry. Um, and Cleon is trashed, essentially, in this play. And at one point, two slaves of Demos, who are coincidentally, perhaps, called Demosthenes and Nicias, they complain that Cleon stole, stole the credit due to Demosthenes for the victory at Pylos. It was because Cleon had done so well that he had to be disregarded or trashed. If he had messed up in Sphacteria, that is, if he had lost the battle, one could plausibly imagine Thucydides and Aristophanes having a real field day with him. Look at how they treated him, even though he was victorious. My loss, the Sphacterian campaign was the high point of the Archidamian War for the Athenians. And to an extent, it lulled them into overcommitment. Because flushed with success, there was a move now to abandon Pericles' second prong of his strategy of not extending the frontiers of the Athenian Empire during the war. And this is seen in the imperialistic invasion of Boeotia in the year 424 BC. Thebes was doing its utmost at this time to assert its hegemony over Boeotian towns, and Thebes' alliance with Sparta was a major cause for concern. It is significant that Nicias took no part in this venture, in the Athenian invasion of Boeotia, and that's not because he was against this enterprise, but rather because, probably, he was still living down the humiliation of handing over his command to Cleon, and then seeing Cleon do what he, Nicias, the elected Zarategos, could not do, and do so in days. Although the Athenians gained some successes in Boeotia, they suffered a major defeat at the town of Delium in 420. Uh, which undid all of their gains in Boeotia to that date. But the worst loss for the Athenians was that of their former colony of Amphipolis, all the way in the north in Thrace. This city-state had been founded in 434 BC and was located close to rich natural uh, timber reserves. In 424 BC, the Spartans began to get involved in the Chalcidice region. Those are those three kind of finger-like extensions up in the north. They're in Thrace, uh, where their general Brasidas won over a number of Athenian allies to the Spartan side. Apparently, these allies were not happy with the extortionate increase in Forros that Cleon had arranged, and the Macedonian king at this time, a fellow named Perdiccas, uh, also supported them. Uh, the increase in Spartan influence in the north worried the Athenians because of the need to preserve their influence there in this region. Let's not forget why they got involved in Potidaea, which is up there in that same region, originally in 432. Uh, it was to protect their interests there, these timber and also uh, silver mines too. Uh, nothing had changed since 432 BC when Brasidas uh, turned his attention to Amphipolis. Athens immediately deployed a force northwards under the command of Thucydides himself, the historian. He arrived too late to save Amphipolis. Apparently, Brasidas didn't need to storm the place because the people of Amphipolis voluntarily opened their gates to him. Although Thucydides couldn't be blamed, can't be blamed for any of this, nevertheless, he was exiled from Athens for 20 years because of military incompetence. And Cleon himself may have actually been the person behind this move. Well, Brasidas now began to turn the war in favor of Sparta, even though the Athenians still held Spartan, the Spartan captives from Sphacteria. Hmm. 
Uh, the loss of Amphipolis and the Spartan gains allowed Nicias to regain some of his influence in the assembly. Uh, he was moderate in his politics, and that naturally brought him into conflict. You know, the Spartan government was also in favor of peace at this time, but by now they were also coming to distrust their own man, Brasidas. Brasidas seems to have been something of a loose cannon. His activities, um, uh, his activities in northern Greece basically were uh, were a cause of alarm for Sparta because um, he seems to have been. Uh, well, thanks to, to thanks to uh, the Spartan attitude of kind of distrust towards him and Nicias's urgings, a one-year truce was drawn up between Athens and Sparta in the year 423. This truce was soon shattered by Brasidas's activities in Northern Greece. And there he encouraged the city of Scione in the Chalcidice to revolt from Athens. And, uh, and this move allowed Cleon to disparage the Spartans in the assembly. And as a result in 422 BC, truce expired. Cleon, who was elected Strategos again, was able to persuade the assembly to send troops under his command, reconquer, Amphipolis. Down with Sparta. At Amphipolis, Cleon and Brasidas met in battle. According to Thucydides, Cleon acted prematurely, and as a result, his troops engaged the Spartans. At any rate, the Athenians lost the Battle of Amphipolis. However, Cleon and Brasidas were both killed in the fighting. Yet, even in death, Thucydides had nothing good to say about Cleon. He says that he never intended to stand his ground, that it's Cleon never intended to stand his ground, but that he fled and was speared in the back as he ran away. In fact, Thucydides speaks more glowingly of Brasidas' death, and that Brasidas was the enemy, the Spartan. And incidentally, the Athenian assembly resolved to kill all the men of Scione and enslave the women and children, precisely what Cleon had advocated for Mytilene in 427. Um, and look at how he was ripped apart for that uh, by Thucydides. And yet you can see it was basically standard fare in those days. Um, now the Athenians um, actually would have come to do the same exact thing a little while later on the island of Milos in the, in the Cyclades in the year 416. So again, what Cleon had proposed in 427 BC was not uncommon. Cleon, I think, was one of the better demagogues. If I were to give him kind of uh, a little sort of um, analysis here, some little, a little post-mortem. And I think that he doesn't deserve the bad press that Thucydides, Aristophanes, and even a century later, the Athenian constitution gave him. We may well have had hidden agendas. He may well have acted in the city's best interest at times and in his own interests at other times, but I think he was right to reject the Spartan overtures towards East uh, in 425 BC. And, uh, and, uh, and he did engineer a great victory at Sphacteria in 424. Cleon saw the need to counter Spartan influence in the North. And although he was clearly not the man to beat Brasidas in battle, he did lead a force North and he did make a stand against him. He wasn't a coward. We have no evidence to support Thucydides' account of how Cleon died or that he was thinking of deserting. How would Thucydides even know uh, what was going through Cleon's mind anyway? The one person in those years who didn't command much respect was Nicias, uh, but no one said anything bad about him. And why not? Because he was an aristocrat. He was from the right side of the track, same side as the Battle of Amphipolis, therefore, was decisive in that Brasidas's death ended Spartan policies in the north. And Cleon's death allowed Nicias to return to dominate the assembly. Both sides were ready for peace, and after negotiations during the winter of 422 to 421 BC, the peace of Nicias was agreed to in March of 421. Uh, it was to last for 50 years. Okay, the word in Greek is very clear. It's not, it's an anopoke. It is a truce, an armistice, not an irene, not a, um, a full peace. That would, be, that would be like an all out, uh, you know, nation of hostilities. And 
the Peace of Nicaea was agreed to in March 421. It was supposed to last for 50 years, and among its terms was that Sparta would remain hegemon of the Peloponnesian League, and Athens would remain hegemon of its empire. Athens was also supposed to restore Pylos and return the prisoners of war from Sacteria. And Sparta was supposed to hand over Amphipolis. However, neither side honored this part of the deal. To make matters worse, the key Spartan allies of Corinth, Megara, and Boeotia refused to agree to the peace. They refused to sign it. Corinth was still after blood from its defeat at the hands of the Athenians off Barsaira and at Potidaia. Megara was still smarting from the Megarian decree, thus Athens held its port, Nicaea. And during the peace negotiations that led to the peace of Nicias, Nicias, the Spartans could have insisted on the Athenians returning Nicaea to Megara, but they didn't, so that upset the Megarians. Finally, the Boeotians, under the terms of the peace, had to hand over a border fortress called Panactum to Athens. They not only refused to hand it over, but they destroyed it for good measure. So in 421 BC, the big question was not whether the peace of Nicias would last for 50 years, but really how long would it last before hostilities broke out? And what direction would the war take after hostilities broke? And we will find out the answers to these questions in the next portion of our lecture.